This is an auspicious day for your college. I, not only did we win two basketball championships at City University, not only we have three Salk scholars in a row, but tonight we have Dr. Mohammed Yunus to speak to us. And any institution, any college that can host Dr. Mohammed Yunus is a special institution. So York is a special institution this evening. It's special for another reason this evening, in that we are initiating today, with the cooperation of Dr. Yunus and Grameen Bank, a special scholarship program. And we'll tell you about this in a little while, but it's a scholarship program to bring students from Bangladesh, but not any students from Bangladesh, students whose parents were once the poorest of the poor to come to study at your college on a full scholarship. And we hope to do that and have a joint, <laughs> and also have a joint internship program in which students can go from York, any student go from York, and spend the summer in Bangladesh working with Grameen Bank, and Bangladeshi University students can come to New York City, maybe study at York, maybe work with a social business or a social enterprise organization. The true meaning of course, cultural exchange. Now, Dr. Yunus has been uh, introduced by royalty, kings and queens. He has been introduced by presidents and prime ministers. He has been introduced by world leaders, and he's also been introduced by simple, poor village people. Knowing Dr. Yunus a little, and a number of you know him as well, I'm sure the latter category he prizes the most. So I'm not a small, simple village person, and I'm not a president or a prime minister, but let me attempt to introduce Dr. Yunus and tell you about the program tonight. Um, the provost at your college, my colleague, Dr. Griffith, talks about when you introduce people, you should make sure you cover who, what, where, when, how, and why. He's a former journalist. I'm a former journalist. The president's a former journalist. So we adopt that. So first, who is Mohammed Yunus? Now, for all of you in this auditorium, there are probably about five to 10 of you who don't know. So for the five or 10 of you who don't know, take out your notepads, make believe this is a large lecture hall, and this is the quiz. Dr. Yunus, who has appeared on a number of shows lately, talk shows, and he's appeared on Oprah Winfrey, he's appeared on Charlie Rose, he has appeared on um, John Stewart's Daily Show, even Stu Stephen Colbert. If he appears on David Letterman, there's probably gonna be a top 10 list. And this is not gonna be a top 10 list to roast Dr. Yunus, but to give you the who of Dr. Yunus. Dr. Yunus is an economist, he is a teacher, he is a banker, he is an entrepreneur. Business Week said he is the, one of the 30 entrepreneurs of all time. He is a one-man think tank. He is an author. He is an activist for the poor. He is a women's rights advocate. He is an environmentalist, and he is a Nobel Prize winner. That's only 10. I probably can go on and on. Now, when we get to the what, where, when, and how, what you have to remember if you're taking notes is a little over 30 years ago in the village of Jopra in rural Bangladesh, Mohammed Yunus, who is a professor of economics at Chittagong University, loaned $27, the equivalent of 27 American dollars, to 42 women who were making stools. That happened 31 years ago. From that $27 to 42 women, sprang what we know today as the microcredit, microenterprise movement throughout the world. So today in Bangladesh, Grameen Bank, which is founded in 1983, has six billion dollars in assets. It has loaned money to seven million borrowers, 97 percent of whom were women. It has spread to hundreds of countries, hundreds of countries throughout the world, and millions upon millions of borrowers. One individual loaning $27 to 42 different individuals. 
That is the where, the when, the how, and the what of Dr. Yunus. Now it gets to the why. Why did he do this? And clearly he did this if you read any of his stuff or any of his speeches, is because of the elimination of poverty. Poverty, if you look at it into a, almost a medical sense, is a disease. It's a disease that stunts growth. It is a disease that leads to dying instead of living. And what Dr. Yunus said is that credit should be a human right. People should be able to reach out of poverty. That is one of the whys. There are two of other whys that I think are extremely important, and I borrow this from Dr. Yunus. This is an educational institution, and I, I'm afraid I'm going to be accused of plagiarism. And I want to tell two quick Yunus anecdotes. And my wife who's sitting in the first row has heard these over and over again, so she has to close her ears to this. One is, considering that he has loaned money to the poorest of the poor, mainly women, today in Bangladesh, there are 18,000 college and university students who have either graduated or going to college. When you think of this, some of these people would have never gone to school in the first place. So one of the whys is the empowerment of education, what this institution is all about. The second why, which stems for the first why, and this is the latest Eunice story I heard when I went to one of his book signings, is that one of those graduates is a medical doctor who graduated from medical school in Bangladesh. She took Dr. Eunice back to her village to meet her mother, who is illiterate. Dr. Eunice pauses at this point, he's backstage, and he says, and he thought she could have been a doctor. And then that woman introduced Dr. Eunice to her mother, the grandmother. And Dr. Eunice said, and she could have been a doctor. So when you put those two stories together, the why is not simply the elimination of poverty, is the why is human potential and how you grow human potential. So that's a little summation, and other people will talk about Dr. Eunice as well this evening. Why your college? This small college, part of the City University of New York. The reason for this is that about a year and a half ago, there was a young man here, his name is Rush Del Bari, who came to see me because Dr. Eunice, before he won the Nobel Prize, was going to come to New York City, and they wanted to use this theater as an event to host Dr. Eunice. And he mentioned to me a prominent person from Bangladesh was coming, and I asked who it was, and he said it was Mohammed Yunus, and then I started talking about Mohammed Yunus. And he was floored that a Westerner, somebody from New York, would know about this guy. And from there, we started a relationship, and that relationship sprang to a couple of more individuals. A gentleman named Abu Tahir, who is with a newspaper here called Bengala Patrika, and Dr. Shokat Ali, who you will hear from in a few minutes, who is a professor of business at Long Island University. And together we started thinking about the type of program that I mentioned, the scholarship program and whatever. Last summer, a gentleman named Mohammed Jangir, who happens to be a political commentator, a journalist, cultural activist in Bangladesh, and also the brother of Mohammed Yunus came, and we talked to him about this. And his angle was to put down that these scholarships for, should be for the children of the members of Grameen Bank which was a wonderful, wonderful idea considering what the City University is all about. And Mohammed Jangir had another idea. What he said is that he wanted this evening to be, in his words, a mini Nobel Prize ceremony. So simply, I'm gonna go off the stage in a minute, but, and you're not gonna hear from, not only from um, Mohammed Yunus, but there will be a Chancellor's Medal from the City University that will be given to him. There will be cultural performances, there will be special presentations, and then there will be a surprise as part of all of this. So this is simply a opportunity not only to celebrate Mohammed Yunus, to say something about this college and what we're trying to do in cooperation with Bangladesh. Um, there is probably another why that this will be at your college and it is the best why that I can think of, which is the president of your college. My colleague, my friend, and my partner, Marcia Keyes, with the provost here. President Keyes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And as you've heard from VP Poseman, I am Marcia Keys. I'm the president of York College of the City University of New York. On behalf of our students, our faculty, and our staff, we want to welcome you to this evening's wonderful celebration. I congratulate the Bangladeshi Club, Mr. Barry, the York College student government, and all of you who came together to make tonight possible. Thank you also to our Executive Vice Chancellor Botman for joining us, and you will hear from her soon. And also, thank you, Vice Chancellor Moore, uh, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, who's here in the audience as well. And we have students from all over CUNY. I know, and I will only mention, that the University Student Senate is very much in the house tonight, and other members of the student body from other institutions. We are really delighted and honored that you have joined us. But you have joined us, of course, for a magnific magnificent evening to hear from Dr. Muhammad Yunus, and indeed you have gotten an introduction already from VP Poseman, but you will hear more. As an educator, I believe first and foremost in the potential of every individual to learn and to achieve at the very highest level. This is the guiding principle of York College, and indeed it is a fundamental mission of the City University of New York that 160 years ago, as the Free Academy created the mission to provide higher education opportunity to all New Yorkers, no matter their economic situation. Professor Eunice, Dr. Eunice, you will appreciate, of course, the City University of New York's history, since it so much parallels your own work to empower the economically disadvantaged to reach full potential in your native Bangladesh and then beyond in the world at large. You have made it your life's work, to help not just the less fortunate, but the poorest of the poor, to lift themselves out of poverty through the founding of the Grameen Bank and all the various institutions that it has spawned. York College is home to more than 6,000 students. And our 6,000 students come from right here in Jamaica, Queens, but they also come from over 50 countries, they speak 37 different languages, and they're enrolled here at York in 40 different academic programs. Some 200 of these students come from the country of Bangladesh. And that is why tonight, your presence, Dr. Yunus, here tonight is so very, very meaningful to us. You, the audience, have already heard briefly about how this developed. You've also heard of the effort that we plan to move ahead to provide scholarships, to raise scholarship funds for Bangladeshi students to study here at York. You also have heard of the reciprocal re arrangement where we will send York College students, American students, to study and intern in Bangladesh. And we believe here at York that this kind of exchange provides a rare opportunity for very, very meaningful study abroad programs for our students. We embrace, Dr. Yunus, the partnership with you and with Grameen Bank that gives fuller meaning to York College's ability to provide our students with a world of opportunity. Again, as president of your college, it is really heartfelt that I welcome you all, that I welcome our very special guest. I thank you all for being here, and I thank Dr. Yunus. And in the words that I just learned tonight, shagatum. Thank you for being here. So President Keyes brought greetings from your college, 
and now we have to sort of reach back in time. And reaching back in time is one of my uh, new and very best friends, <laughs> Dr. Shokhat Ali. Dr. Shokhat Ali is a professor at Long Island University, not part of the city university, but part of the university family in the city of New York. And Dr. Ali told me immediately that he was a student of Dr. Yunus's, Professor Yunus's at Chittagong University. And he has been very, very helpful in terms of putting this program together tonight and providing all the links that are necessary. Dr. Ali. My great teacher, Nobel laureate Dr. Muhammad Yunus, distinguished guests, faculty members, students, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and assalamu alaikum. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome Nobel laureate Dr. Muhammad Yunus at your college campus to inaugurate the Yunus Scholarship Program. First, a flower bouquet is being presented to Dr. Muhammad Yunus by a second generation Bangladeshi American, a ninth grade student from Stuyvesant High School, one of the finest high schools in the United States, Ms. Farjana Tasmin Ali, and a fourth grader, Ibrahim Shaukot from PS124. Uh, sir. Uh, thank you all. I must say that we started the journey for the scholarship program at your college almost a year ago. Under this program, 10 students from Bangladesh will be coming to the United States for research and studies, and 10 students from your college will do the same in Bangladesh. However, today's event could not have been possible without a couple of kind-hearted people and their sacrifices. They are known as founding members of the UNUS scholarship program. They are Mr. Rashidul Bari, a year college student, a young promising writer. He has written numerous books, including two books on Muhammad Yunus. Mr. Abu Tahir, an award-winning journalist. If you are there, Abu Tahir, yeah, please. And uh, Rashidul Bari, yeah, come, please. Mr. Abu Tahir is the Secretary General of Bangladesh Journalist and Writers Association of North America. He is an executive editor, the weekly Bangla Potika in New York. He is also the editor of the international news agency, The News World. The next person is Mohammad Jangir, a prominent Bangladeshi journalist and a TV host. Due to some technical problems, he is not with us today. The last two people are Vice President Gerald Posman and I. I asked Jerry, you are the pillar of this program. How could I acknowledge your contribution today? He said, and I quote, the best way to acknowledge a person's contribution is not to mention his name on the stage. Well, Jerry, I'm very sorry. I could not mention our names, but please give all of them a big round of applause. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> the 
Dear sir, over a decade ago, long before you won the Nobel Peace Prize, during the micro summit at New York Hilton, you met with a Bangladeshi group on the side. At the same time, in Indian subcontinent, with the exception of Bangladesh, both Pakistan and India tested the nuclear bombs simultaneously. That day, I mentioned in my speech that India and Pakistan are proud for their nuclear arms, but we don't need atom bomb in Bangladesh because we have Muhammad Yunus. <clears throat> He's our agent for peace, and we are proud of him. I remember you responded by saying, Shaukat, you are right. I am for peace, and I am a proud Bangladeshi. A decade passed by, and then you received the Nobel Peace Prize. We congratulate you for your courage, for your achievement, your vision for peace and poverty elevation. Dear respectable sir, today you are not only representing Bangladesh, but also of our four billion poor people on earth. Your philosophy of social business and investment is the solution for poverty elevation. Your dream of creating a world without poverty is the future of capitalism in true sense. For over 30 years, you have been knocking every door in every corner in Asia, America, Europe, and Africa, telling the story of poor people to whoever listens to you. Your story is full of limitless human potential, inner energy, and human capacity of the poor people. Today, based on your social business and investment theory, Harvard and Oxford universities are seriously considering to introduce social MBA program at those institutions. At Oslo, during your Nobel lecture, you rightly warned the world, and I quote, it is possible to create a poverty-free world because poverty is not created by poor people. It has been created and sustained by the economic and social system that we have designed for ourselves. You reminded the world by saying poverty is created because we built our theoretical framework on assumptions which underestimates human capacity by designing concepts which are very, very narrow. This is very significant, sir. And I must say, please forgive me. I will not surprise if you get a second Nobel Prize in the field on economics, too. Since you received the Nobel Prize, you did not take a rest with your family, even three days in a row. You are always on the road. From Technap to Guantanamo Bay, from Swaziland to Switzerland, your mission and vision has never been changed. This is very unprecedented. As one of your economics students from the University of Chittagong, we wish you good luck and good health. At the end, we the three people, sir. You know who are they are? Of course, sir, Shaukat, Bari, and Abu Tahir, again requesting you to consider opening a Grameen University in Bangladesh. <clears throat> sir, if you need money, please let these three people know. We'll arrange something for you. <laughs> Finally, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Marcia Kitsch, the president of your college. I am from Long Island University, but she always treated me as one of her colleagues here at your college campus. Similarly, Dr. Griffith, provost and senior vice president for academic affairs, who told me at our first meeting 
my door is always open to you, Dr. Ali. I thank you for him for his magnanimity. Thank you all for your magnanimity. Now let's enjoy the rest of the evening. Long live Muhammad Yunus, long live your college, and long live Bangladesh. Thank you all. I told Professor Yunus when I met him before that if there was a uh, Nobel Prize for frequent flyer miles, he would also get that one as well. <laughs> he, he, he came in this morning, um, and it was cold but bright, he said. Uh, he is being honored tomorrow night at a function in Manhattan. Then he's flying to London, after that to Bristol, going to Paris, going to Africa, so you have an idea of his schedule. Um, the next part of uh, this event is going to be through the Bangladeshi Institute of Performing Arts. For 14 years, they've dedicated themselves to enriching the lives of Bangladeshi immigrants residing in New York. Through the pre presentation of arts, literature, music, and dance, BIPA enables the students to identify themselves with their roots. So the first presentation will be a patriotic song that will be done by the group. I sing my song in Bangla. I sing the song of Bangla. It is in Bangla where I find my soul time and again. I dream in Bangla. I compose in Bangla. I have traveled a long way on this Bangla's path. Bangla is my jibonanokto, my joy and my essence. I see here I see everywhere my beloved Bangla's presence. Ami Bangla Gan Gai Ami Bangla Gan Gai Ami Amar Ami Kichirodi E Bangla Ikuji Pai Rejoice in Bangla, show my sorrow in Bangla. In Bangla, I cry out in despair. Bangla is my spirit, my maddened bow and arrow. I see here, I see everywhere, my beloved Bangla's presence. Bangla, 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 
in Bangla, I give my love to Bangla. I take it by the hand and humbly approach the people of the world. All the goodness that comes from the seven seas and thirteen rivers flows to me through the Ganga and Bodda. For Bangla is my thirst and Bangla will quench. I see here, I see everywhere my beloved Bangla's presence. About two years ago, uh, a number of us from York College were at a meeting at the uh, Central Administration of the University. As you might know, the university is comprised of about 23 different units, educates 500,000 students in different ways. And at the meeting, I happened to mention, and I don't know what the reason was, except that I sort of mentioned it from time to time, something about Mohammed Yunus. And the person who was the executive vice chancellor and the chief academic officer, my name is Selwyn Botman, who you'll meet in a second, turned to me and said, Mohammed Yunus, that's my hero. So I stored that information away. <laughs> and when we were going to do this event, I said, we need partners. I have, you've seen some of the partners that we have, but we need another partner, which is the university. And I called up uh, Vice Chancellor Botman on the phone, and she immediately said, anything you want to do, <laughs> we'll participate. So um, Vice Chancellor Bartman, Bodman has been a true partner in this, and um, I don't know if she's the one who suggested it, or I was the one who suggested it, but there's something called the Chancellor's Medal, 
which is given out very rarely at the university. And so with that, I introduce Vice Chancellor, Executive Vice Chancellor, and the Provost of the City University of New York, Selma Bachman. Thank you. Good evening. Salam Alaikum. I'd like to add my words of welcome to this very special evening honoring Dr. Muhammad Yunus, an exceptional individual. It is my true pleasure to bestow on Dr. Yunus the City University of New York Chancellor's Medal, and I will get to that very shortly. But first, I want to share with you my own sincere delight in this occasion. I have followed Dr. Yunus's work in the Grameen Bank for two decades, first as a professor of political science, when I not only taught his ideas, but conveyed the extraordinary impact of his life's work. I can attest to the uncommon contributions Dr. Muhammad Yunus has made, and he has made a similar impact on students trying to understand developing societies so they might one day make a contribution as well. For years, Dr. Yunus's voice has been an eloquent and essential one for the importance of empowering women and the benefits of such policies on children and on societies as a whole. On behalf of all of those who hold these beliefs dear, I say to Dr. Yunus a heartfelt thank you. Clearly, there are many reasons why the City University of New York might want to acknowledge Dr. Yunus with the Chancellor's Medal. And I am sure by the end of this evening, you will have heard many details of his truly staggering record of achievement as an economist, a humanitarian, and a global leader. But I will keep this short. Dr. Yunus, I would like now to present to you the medal. Wow. Thank you. That's big. Dr. Yunus, it is with great joy and profound respect that we all have for you and for your accomplishments that I present the Chancellor's Medal to you. And I would like to read it to the audience, if I may. In deep appreciation of Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus, his great work transforms depth, depths of misery into the richness of hope and human achievement one person at a time. Your college, City University of New York, February 11th, 2008. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I only have two words. <laughs> Mohammed Yunus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. It's such a great honor to be here this evening and to receive the Chancellor's Medal. Besides the ceremony around it, the genuine interest in the subject that I always talk about, and the enormous amount of interest that this college has shown in the subject, not through only honoring me this evening, but also announcing some actions 
actions to give scholarships to children of Grameen families to come here in the York College for higher studies. This is a very significant announcement because all the issues that I have been raising in the past kind of sums up in this particular announcement, and I'll come to that later. And I'm very happy this evening. Can I take this off? It's quite heavy. <laughs> Thank you. In October, I was speaking in uh, some of the places in California. I was speaking in uh, Santa Monica. And I left for Papa Dean. And I hear that the fire broke out in Santa Monica. And I spoke in Papa Dean and left for San Diego. And I hear that Papa Dean got into fire. I left San Diego and I hear that San Diego got into fire. And I come here this evening. <laughs> Your college did it ahead of me. <laughs> but that was a false alarm, though. So watch out when you're going out. <laughs> Your college took a big risk <laughs> inviting me after this track record that I got. But it's worth taking the risk. As uh, <clears throat> I was being introduced, all the beautiful things being said about me, I couldn't help restrain myself. So I have to divulge the secret of all this, because it looks like the way I'm presented, I did something so intricate, so difficult. So I'll let you know the secret of it. As you know that I started lending money, the famous story about $27 to 42 people. And out of that grew a whole bank called Grameen Bank. And it is spread all over Bangladesh and beyond Bangladesh. How did it all happen? So that's a question everybody, it pops up in everybody's mind. The secret is it was very simple. There's nothing complicated about it. When you, you are desperate, you do lots of things which you normally you wouldn't do. When we wanted to lend money to the poor people, we had to understand how to do that. And I had no banking background, I never studied banking. And maybe that was an advantage for me because I could do anything I wanted to. If I knew banking, I probably I'll be very careful. <laughs> so what I did when I needed some rules to do the work that I'm doing, I looked at the conventional banks. How do they do it? And once I figured that out, how they do it, I just go ahead and do the opposite. <laughs> and each time I did that, I built up a whole system. So the Grameen Bank and all the procedures which support the whole system is virtually the reverse of the conventional system. 
Conventional banks want you to have lots of money before you can take money from them. The more you have, the more you get. That's the whole basic idea about banking. So we took the cue and reversed it. We said, less you have, more attention you get. If you have nothing, you get the highest attention. So that was very simple. All you have to do, look at them, turn it around. Conventional banks want you to have lots of money already so that they can tie you down. And against that, what you got, they give you some. The collateral. You have to have collateral. So looking at conventional banks, we said, uh-huh, we know what to, we have to do. Just, just get rid of the collateral. So we got rid of the collateral. There is no collateral in our work. And no guarantee. We don't ask anybody to guarantee any one of our borrowers. She is on her own. Then we did something else. We got rid of the lawyers. <laughs> we don't have any lawyers in our system. Isn't it fun? <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> so no collateral, no guarantee, no lawyers. And it works. Conventional banks want you to have all the experience in business before they will give you money because they want you to be an expert in your business so that they you can use the money that you get from the bank as experts and earn money to pay them back. Thank you. We reversed it. We go to the poor people and poor women. When we approach the poor women and tell her how Grameen Bank can help her, giving her money and she can start some business, earn some money, improve her life, after you give the whole spill, she says, no, not me. Don't give money to me. I don't know anything. I don't know what to do with your money. And I'm scared of money. I never touched money in my life. We train our staff in Grameen Bank how to do the job. One of the part of the training is when a woman says, no, I don't know anything. I never touched money, I never handled money in my life. We tell our staff, she's the one we are looking for. So you have to now go back to her again and again so that you can build confidence in her. So that finally she can say, maybe I should try. So this is again the reverse of what the conventional banks do. Conventional banks start with someone who already has lots of experience. If you go to a conventional bank and say, sorry, I don't know the business, but give me money, you know what they will do. And it, today we have seven and a half million borrowers in Grameen Bank, in Bangladesh. 97% of them women. Almost every one of them start like that, pleading that she doesn't know anything, please don't come anywhere near me. I don't know what to do with this. But we don't give up. We train our staff by saying that when she says no, 
I don't know what to do with money. Always remember, this is not her voice. It is the voice of the history we have created around her. History of fear. History of rejection. History of a feeling that you are nobody. So you don't expect that you come to her and offer her money to start a business and she'll grab it and start running, doing the business. This is not going to happen. So you have to peel off the fear, layers and layers of fear that we have generated around her for years and years of the way society has treated her. And finally, when those layers are peeled off, the real person can come up and say, maybe I should try. So that's, uh, again, something you do quite differently in your system than what is practiced in the conventional system. So if you go down the line, one after another, you'll see how different the system is. Conventional banks are owned by the rich people. And particularly rich men. But the Grameen Bank is owned by poor people. And particularly poor women. All our borrowers happen to be the shareholders of Grameen Bank. So it's owned by the borrowers. When the Nobel Prize was announced, it was announced that half of the prize money will come to me as an individual. Another half of the prize will go to the Grameen Bank. So the Nobel Committee called me up several days after the announcement to find out the details of my visit to Oslo when I'm, all the details of the trip. And they asked, who will receive the prize which is given to Grameen Bank? I immediately said, of course, it will be received by the owners of the bank. And when I say owners, they wanted to know how many owners. <laughs> they thought maybe four, five, six, ten. I said seven and a half million. <laughs> For a few seconds, they didn't say anything. They kept quiet. <laughs> because Norway has only four and a half million people. <laughs> I saw they were very worried about what's going to happen. So I kind of reassured them. I said, no, we are not bringing seven and a half million. <laughs> what we'll do, we'll bring the nine representatives who are elected in the board. The board is made up by the representatives of those seven and a half million borrowers. So I said, we'll bring those nine as the owners to receive the prize. And that's what we did. All nine of them went. And one of them, out of the nine, stood up in front of the audience to receive the prize. It's a village woman from Bangladesh. Never heard of Oslo, never heard of Norway. The best we are trying to explain to them what is snow, because we'll be expecting snow when you get there. <laughs> So when we talk about Grameen Bank or microcredit, it's not just lending tiny amounts to a poor person. It's the way you look at the whole issue. Because all along, conventional banks were arguing that 
they don't lend money to the poor because they are not credit worthy. And that's what irritated me that uh, without even trying, they have declared a verdict, which almost sounds like a death sentence. In a world where you need money to catch money, you don't have, if you don't have a dollar in your hand, you don't catch a dollar. But nobody gives you the first dollar in your hand so that you can catch the dollar. In empty hand, you don't catch anything. So when the conventional banks say that you are not credit worthy, meaning that you are dead, only future you have is to slave for somebody else. You can't go for yourself. And that's what we challenged. We said, no, we can try. We didn't know whether it will happen. That's another aspect that I would like to highlight that you always don't have to know everything to do things. Even sometimes not knowing is a blessing. Because sometimes knowing may be wrong kind of knowing and you are stuck. Advantage of not knowing is you can try out all kinds of things. You're free. And that's what exactly happened to us. Because we didn't know, we were free. And we dared into things which somebody who knows probably will never do that. Always we encouraged our borrowers to send their children to school. These are all illiterate women. They cannot read, they cannot write. Seven and a half million illiterate women. But all along, we encourage them to send the children to school. This is something also put together in terms of what we call 16 decisions. And one of those 16 decisions is we shall send our children to schools. And we promoted that, inspired that. And in early years of Grameen Bank, we succeeded having all the children in school. We were very happy. The children are in school. Then we noticed that not only they went to school, some of these kids from illiterate families are at the top of the class. So this is an amazing experience to see this. The parents are totally illiterate. Literacy never entered those families. But these little kids come to the school for the first time in their history of their families. They were not backbenchers. They were, some of them, coming at the top of the class in the performance. So we wanted to celebrate that. We were so thrilled by this experience. So we introduced scholarships in Grameen Bank. And that tradition we continued. Every year we identify those kids and give them scholarships. And then have a little ceremony in the village. All the important people in the village are invited. The teachers of the schools and college are invited so that these children get the total village attention. And then we give them the money, the scholarship money, and the ceremony. And the ch families feel proud for the first time. The children are accomplishing something which never in the family ever achieved. Last year, we gave 51,000 students scholarships. So each year, <laughs> each year more and more of these children are coming up to receive scholarships. Then we noticed something else. Not only they are receiving scholarships, 
and doing well in school, some of them are <clears throat> continuing with education. We thought maybe they will just finish their primary education and we will feel proud that we have done something nobody else could do before, that we have helped them to go to finishing their primary education. They finished their primary education, then continued into high, high school. And then some of them went to colleges, universities, medical schools, engineering schools. So we got back again onto our thinking, we should be supporting this. So we introduced education loans. Anybody who qualifies to go into higher education, entire financing will be done by Grameen Bank. And that's what we have been doing. Right now, there are 21,000 students in medical schools, engineering schools, universities. Some of them have already completed their PhDs. Imagine coming from illiterate families, going into all these centers of education, not just simple literacy, but at a very high level of education. So that's the message I kind of carry around, inviting other universities around the world to offer scholarships to Grameen children for two reasons. One, that lifts the whole family and the whole society that yes, one child comes into higher education, another child kind of inspired to go into it. At the same time, educational institutions themselves benefit from it. When you are talking about global issues of poverty and diseases and terrible conditions around people, it's no longer some bookish academic discussion. In the classroom, you have a representative who's coming from those environment and he or she can tell you the whole story firsthand. Not somebody's imagination, not somebody's study, some tables, some graphs, is the real people. The whole discussion changes. It becomes more real. So this is how you transform a society, transform human beings. Looking at these kids, you cannot escape the question, is this something wrong in you? Why were you poor before? Why your parents are poor? When you go to village in Bangladesh, you meet these women who are Grameen Bank borrowers, and you meet this group of young people, the boys and girls who are in medical schools, engineering schools, coming from those parents. When you're talking to the parents, they are just the traditional poor people in Bangladesh. The moment you talk to these young people, suddenly you're in another world. They're just like any other kids anywhere in the world. They're doing their work as a medical students or engineering students or a computer science or mathematics or philosophy and talking in that language. <clears throat> in one generation, <clears throat> side by side, you see the difference. And you come to the conclusion, poverty is not created by people. There's nothing wrong in these people. Poverty is created by the system that we have created, the institutions that we built, policies that we promote, concepts that we designed. They are the ones who created poverty. So poverty is an artificial imposition on people. It's not a natural 
things in people. It's nothing inherent in people. <clears throat> and I give examples. <clears throat> Example of an institution like financial institutions. I said, why financial institution in the whole world reject two-third of the world population? Not just a small group, two-third of the world population do not qualify to receive service from the financial institutions. But we accept it. We don't ever think that there's anything wrong. That's our problem. We don't question why they can't do it. If we could extend that financial service to every single human being, I think people would be very different than what they are right now. Even in the United States, right here, with the most sophisticated banking system in the whole world, you go around, you see check cashing companies. It's not a good testimony to the most sophisticated financial system. Why do you have to go to a check cashing company? Because you cannot open a bank account in a conventional bank. You're too small for them. They will not allow you to open a bank account. So when you receive your check from your employer or from the government, you cannot put it into your bank account so that your $1,000 check can give you $1,000 in cash. You take that check to check cashing companies and they rip you off. And we don't challenge it. We think that's the way it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be that way. Everybody's entitled to open a bank account. Nothing wrong with anybody. And one of the person, <clears throat> a high official in the administration was mentioning to me when I was discussing this, said, do you know, Dr. Yunus, where the check cashing is a thriving business in this country? I said, I don't know, I see it everywhere. I see in the newspaper, advertising, television, commercial, check cashing companies. So the most thriving check cashing business goes around the military basis. I was shocked to hear that. That people who work in the army and the navy or whatever, they can't even get their check cashed in a bank account. They have to go to check cashing companies. And then you hear about payday loans just a small amount of money you need. You have a regular job, you have salary, everything, but you cannot get a loan. So you go to the payday loan people. 40%, 50% interest or more. And then you see pawn shops everywhere. These are big signs telling you that things are not right. So we have to change those institutions, make them right, so that people don't have to suffer. They have all the energy, all the capacity, all the creativity in the whole world, but they cannot bring it out because the system doesn't allow them to. We have been, <clears throat> this microcredit became known and it's introduced in uh, many areas of uh, United States for a long time now. But it's still, it is a very tiny, tiny efforts. So recently we started, we wanted to do it in a big way to show that it can be done. We said, let's take the challenge. So we created Grameen America to address those issues, check cashing, payday loans, pawn shops, and all those. We started a small program right here in New York, in Queens, in Jackson Heights. 
we will test it out, we'll develop our prototype so that we can, once it's done, we know how to do it, then we can take it out everywhere. So it's a matter of putting your mind into it. Nothing is impossible. If you see a problem, there are more than one solutions to that. It's a question of choosing the right solution. There are many solutions. Just choose the one which comes out the best. To ignore the problem is not something human beings are supposed to be doing. Another concept that I've been <clears throat> struggling with and trying to tell people is the concept of business. The theoretical framework of economics gives you only one kind of business. There is no two kinds. That one kind is the business to make money. Profit maximization is the mission of business. And I'm saying that the economic, that the theoreticians who build those economic theories kind of ignored the real human being as they are. And instead they created a kind of a robot-like human being. Only thing they enjoy is making money, nothing else. And not only making money, making money the most, profit maximization. The point I make that human beings, real human beings are not money-making machines. Real human being is much bigger than that. Money-making is an important part of human being, but not the totality of human being. So I'm saying that uh, maybe we should bring the real human being in economics rather than the robot-like human being that is being introduced. If we do that, then we need to create at least one more type of business, business to do good to people. So the existing business is about benefiting me alone. Only thing I do, everything I do is for me. The second type, the second type of business that I'm proposing and calling it social business is all about others, nothing about me. It's again the reversal. I said, human beings are like that. They want to benefit themselves and they also, also help others. They go out, they go out of the way to do things for others, to make a difference. Something appeals to them. I said, we see, we see, the, see it every time when we go into politics, same human being. In politics, people are giving their lives, giving their time, giving their energy for goals which will benefit the society, which will ben change the world. But the moment we come to economics, suddenly all these things disappear. We become machines, money-making machines. I said, that's wrong, the same human being. So if we open this door of social business, some people will be able to express themselves fully by participating in that. We created some of these social businesses in Bangladesh. One is uh, called Grameen Danone Company. Danone is a yogurt company. So we, we, this joint venture we created to produce yogurt for the malnourished children in Bangladesh. We put all the macronutrients which are missing in these children into this yogurt. So it becomes fortified yogurt and make it very cheap 
available to the poorest children so that they can enjoy it. It's a delicious yogurt. In the process, they changed their health situation. There are millions of malnourished children in Bangladesh and millions, millions of more in many, many other countries. But nothing comes to them. So we said, we can have a social business. So this is a social business. Here, Danone will not get any dividend out of it. Grameen will not get any dividend out of it. Entire money is dedicated, invested to bring this yoga to the children in a business way, meaning that the company doesn't lose money, but nobody is waiting to make money out of it. We can create lots of those companies, healthcare companies, sanitation companies, housing companies, social business companies. 47 million people in this country, in the United States, don't have health insurance. You know better than me what does it mean not to have so health insurance. So I said this could be an attractive area for social business because money-making companies don't want to go there because they have better things to do. They make more money somewhere else. So why come here? So this would be a very attractive area for social business. The other day I was having a meeting with the International Vaccine Institute people. This is located in Korea. They are visiting Bangladesh to meet me. They are explaining there are six what they call orphan diseases in the world. And for the first time I heard the word terminology orphan diseases. I said, I know human beings being orphaned, but I didn't know diseases being orphaned. I said, what is the orphan disease? So the orphan disease is, it has the vaccine, it has the solution to overcome this disease, but nobody produces it. Because pharmaceutical companies don't find it financially attractive investment area. They make fancy lifestyle medicines, whatever it means. And make a lot of money. They're not interested in people dying of some disease because these are poor people, they cannot afford to pay high prices to make for them to make money. So they would rather die. They die, they die. Cholera is one. Cholera vaccine is available. It's developed, it's out there. But no company produces it. Typhoid is another one vaccine available, it's developed, but no company produces it. There are six of them, six such diseases. So I told them, I said, well, this is another area for social business. I said, I'll be very much interested to produce at least two to begin with. <clears throat> Cholera and typhoid. I said, how much can, will it cost when finally it is produced at the cost price? How much would it be? He said, it would be less than 50 cents. So did anybody ever produce cholera vaccine? He said, yes, there's a Swiss company which produces, used to produce it. They used to charge $30. So that's the kind of price differential. What you can produce for 50 cents you want to make $30 out of it. So this is an area of social business I'm trying to promote that maybe we need to review the whole structure of economics so that we bring all these issues which, which are left out from the economic area, brought into the economic world. And the same human being can act as a social agent. Today, many of these things are addressed through philanthropy, through charity. And I point out charity dollar has only one life. You can use it only once. Because it's once used, it's done. But the same problem, if you can address it as a social business, 
it becomes very powerful because that dollar recycles. It works back and come back again and again. And you create an institution. It doesn't disappear. In charity, it's a program. Once you have done it, it's finished. But in social business, it's an institution building. You build the business. And you improve, you innovate, you, you continue to pursue this. Because money is not a problem, because money recycles within the system. So if you can address those issues of institutions, policies, and concepts, fix them, there will be no poor people. Because if it is artificial, which it is, it will disappear. And I said, then we'll, what we'll do, we'll create poverty museums. Because there won't be any poverty in the world. And children would like to know what is this poverty that we talk about in the class. So the teachers will take them to the poverty museum to show. <laughs> so our task is to decide on the date, which year we are going to build this poverty museum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If we have time, we can have some questions, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give uh, Dr. Yunus a second to have a drink, relax for a moment. Um, <laughs> Professor Yunus, and I emphasize Professor Yunus, as you all can see, this is a, a teaching moment here. And what we want to do is have a interchange between students and teachers. And all of us are students. And let's assume that this gentleman is our teacher. So we have mics placed here. We would like people to approach the microphone. We have a certain amount of time. I would like you to announce who you are. I would like you to indicate your question for Dr. Yunus. And please ask a question. Do not make a statement. And uh, Dr. Yunus will respond. But before we do that, I would like to take probably two minutes out to do the following. You have heard Dr. Yunus talk about social business and his dream. As you might know, Dr. Yunus has been on a book tour recently because he has written a book. It is the second book he has written. The first is Banker to the Poor. It's called Creating a World Without Poverty. This is a very important book because it is the subsequent book to Banker to the Poor and takes this to a next level, as Dr. Yunus said. It takes microcredit and talks about social business. What we at your college and the City University would like to do is to have everybody walk away with this book today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. As you can imagine, there is no better way to honor and recognize Dr. Yunus than to read the book. <laughs> So the book is now being passed out to everybody in the audience. People are lined up to ask questions. And I promised the Bangladeshi students at your college they would get the first opportunity okay. to ask questions of Dr. Yunus. So is Mr. Islam here? Mr. Islam asks the first question. Please step to the microphone. Yes, working. Uh, sir, we are honored to have you in our institution. The question I bring before you today, perhaps the concern of every Bangladeshi here. Concerning the, considering the current economic condition of, in Bangladesh, where do you want to see Bangladesh within the next 20 years? 
Well, Bangladesh has done pretty well in the past 20 years. So I, I would expect that the uh, next 20 years will be much better than the past 20 years. Bangladesh economy has been going very steadily. During the decade of 90s, our growth rate was on an average of 5%. Today, our growth rate is 6.7%. Uh, and we hope to exceed 8% very soon. And our uh, healthcare indicators have been steadily rising. So our healthcare condition is improving every year. Health indicators are overtaking many of our neighboring countries like uh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and others. So on the health indicator side also, Bangladesh is doing very well. And the best thing Bangladesh has done is on women empowerment side. It's a dramatic change in women empowerment in Bangladesh. Also on the population growth, Bangladesh is a success story. So population growth rate used to be 3% and above, 3.3%. Today, that population growth rate has come down to 1.4%, so less than half of what it used to be some 25 years back. So we are we also, right now, we are at the stage where we are well-placed, very comfortably placed in achieving all the Millennium Development Goals, all eight of them. So this is no mean success, this is a very, significant success because not many countries in the world which will achieve all eight Millennium Development Goals. And on the poverty issue, the poverty is declining in Bangladesh very steadily. And we are at a very safe level to achieve Millennium Development Goal number one, reduce poverty by half by 2015. Bangladesh will achieve that if everything goes well so far the way it went, it will make it. And if we can improve our situation, we can achieve Millennium Development Goal number one ahead of 2015. We can reduce poverty by half. And one issue that comes, you asked about 20 years, one issue that comes if I raised this question myself. If we can reduce poverty by half by 2015, when should we aim at reducing it to zero? And I put a date, I said 2030. By 2030, Bangladesh could achieve poverty to zero, meaning that we can become a country without any poor person. Okay, thank you. The second question is from our second student at your college, Abu Kahir. Hi, my name is Abul Kahir, and this is my last year, and I'm the student government executive director. And we are honored and delighted, Dr. Yunus, you to, you to be here at your college. My question to you is, we who are born in Bangladesh and now living in the United States, how do you think we can contribute to the development of Bangladesh? as many ways as one can wish. <laughs> because today, the distance between Bangladesh and New York or any place in the world <coughs> is uh, gone, finished, because of the technology. It's a time, it's a period that we have entered in our life that where communication is instantaneous. So whether you are in Bangladesh, whether you are in the United States, it doesn't make much of a difference in whatever you want to do. So just because you are away from, physically away from Bangladesh doesn't mean that you are incapable of doing things in Bangladesh. You are capable of doing Bangladesh. So in any, any particular segment that you want to contribute, you want to be associated, you can do so right from here. And your advantage is you are here, all the new things are happening, all the new dimensions are unleashing. 
and make use of that, bring it to Bangladesh to make it happen so that our changes can become faster. So your uh, location here is not a disadvantage, it's a tremendous advantage. So I would say in any particular area, it's education, health, business, you name it, you can play a very significant role. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good. I will take a question from this side, please. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Yunus. Um, my name is Nazia Tabassum, and I'm a graduate of Queens College. And my question is similar to his, just regarding how young people can be more active. And you had mentioned Grameen Bank of America. What other initiatives of Grameen, or in which other ways can we contribute back to Bangladesh? Thank you. Thank you. Of course, uh, Grameen America could be one area where you can be associated, you can be helpful. And at the same time, same idea anywhere, uh, w whether in this country or some other country, you can do that. Information technology is another one, a big contribution that you can make. The faster we can bring information technology to the poorest people, particularly poor women, the quicker we can change the society um, to get integrated in the rest of the world. So this is another area where you can play a significant role. And in my book, I mention about creating social action groups. You and two of your friends can get together, come up with an idea, this is what we are going to do this year, in 2008, and put it for yourself. And it's your task, your thing, you decide it, make it very small so that it's achievable. Once you achieve that, you make a significant change in yourself and to the society. So you try that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Sir, my name is Ferdos Ahmed. I'm one of the proud students of your college. Um, the question many of us has asked here, I would like to just rephrase it a little bit. You have mentioned earlier in your speech that uh, properties are created by the system and the society. My question is, how can we change the society? How can we change the system? Is there anything we can contribute to that? Yeah, of course. It's a, the framework. You change framework. You change your ideas. The most difficult thing uh, in changing is the changing of mindset. You continue to think the way you think. It's very difficult for people to see things differently than they are used to. So if, if you can play a role in changing people's mind, then you are changing their society. Uh, so this would be one challenge, how to make people think differently than what traditionally they have been thinking. Uh, societies do change. That's how we came all this way. Otherwise, you would be living in the same old style in the caves or still the hunters and gather gatherers uh, would not have changed. So we have changed. We have completely done things which were never done before. And those changes are faster today than it was before. What would have taken 100 years to achieve in changes in the society, today can be done in less than a decade. In less than 10 years, you can change that. And tomorrow, it will be still shorter period. Maybe in five years, you can do what it was, used to take uh, 100 years. Imagine if you just look at the 20 years, which you are familiar with, the 20 years that you have gone through, you have seen it yourself. How much changes has taken place within the past 20 years? If those changes have taken place in the past 20 years, what will be the changes coming up in the next 20 years? It will be at least 50 times as many changes as it was in the last 20 years. So that's the kind of speed society is taking. So changes will become the norm every day. So it's a question of change for what? That's the question we have to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Inez. This is Ainul Abedin. I'm sorry, I had a cough, so my voice should not, uh, is not clear. My name is Ainul Abedin. I'm a general secretary of Bangladesh Society in New York. I know um, you are ambassador of human being. You are an ambassador of humanities. That's why you got the Nobel Prize on peace, because you worry 
and you care of human beings and humanities. As we know, November 15, 2007, we had a cedar, hurricane cedar in Bangladesh, a country who has this kind of problem. In America, in the United States of America, people who live from those, who came from those countries who has a problem like cedar, uh, uh, those people, people, uh, a country from there, that they can have the opportunity, immigration opportunity, which is like they call uh, uh, TPS program. So, uh, if you can, if you are a ambassador, as I know, as I uh, mentioned that you are an ambassador of a human being and humanities. Could you please? advocacy for those people, people come from Bangladesh, living in this country with undocumented and uh, illegally to the government of United States of America to give them and put them in TPS program. And I'll be appreciative for those people. Thank you so much. One of the things that I mentioned in my book, <laughs> again, since, since uh, you raised this question, uh, I, I see a world where there will not be any visa and passports. So I'm with you to, to, uh, to create that world faster than we have done so far. So that, you, you, know, you know, passports didn't exist maybe 100 years back when the Europeans were going all over the world. They were not carrying their passports with them. So when our turn came to go around, <laughs> they invented all those things, passports and visas and homes, home security and all that. <laughs> so that's something that we have to put back in the history that we don't need those things. Uh, this problem will become worse as we go along. You mentioned cedar. Uh, this is something related to uh, climatic change. And Bangladesh is one country where uh, climatic change will affect very heavily. We are on the front line of um, global warming, impact of global warming. The sea level near Bangladesh is rising on an average of three millimeters per year. And Bangladesh, 20% of Bangladesh landmass is under one meter above the sea level just a slightly above the sea level. It's almost at the sea level. So when the sea level rises, your land is not rising, so soon you go under, the sea gets over. Before you go under, your ecology gets all screwed up. You don't have any survival livelihood anymore. So we are one country which is earmarked for global uh, eco-refugees people wandering around without any land for themselves. So one big solution, immediate solution is what you have suggested. Another big solution is, a big solution is to look at the whole issue of global warming itself. And it's rooted in the lifestyle in people in the rich countries. So unless the rich countries change their lifestyle, the world will remain a big threat for global change, climatic change. So we have to go back and see what kind of lifestyle would be consistent with the safety of the world. We cannot go on, live like the way we did. We have been doing so far. So this is an issue that has to be very clearly discussed and everybody gets ready that we don't want to enjoy our life in a way which destroys somebody else's life. So my life should not destroy somebody else's life. That should be the basic principle, and we should be adjusting ourselves to that life. This is the, I do not harm anybody by my enjoyment. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Wa alaikum First, I would like to um, thank, welcome you from my, from deepest part of my heart as one of the Bangladeshi students at your college. Uh, my name is Kazi Fonid Ahmed. Uh, I'm also a student, uh, senator, one of the senator of Uyghur College student government. Uh, today, uh, the question I would like to ask you, 
is that um, in this stage of globalization, what is the major reasons do you think that developing country like Bangladesh remains poor? And what is the responsibility of developed countries to solve this crisis? Yeah. Uh, globalization is something that nobody can stop. It, it's not under anybody's control. So the question is uh, not whether globalization is yes or globalization is no. That's not a relevant formulation. The relevant formulation is right globalization versus wrong globalization. Today, the way globalization is in practice, where the rich countries go and the rest of the world do their business, take over the business of other countries. So it's a one-way kind of benefit. The more powerful you are economically, more wealthy you are, more benefits you reap from globalization. Globalization is supposed to be win-win from both sides, not it's a one-way thing. To ensure that, we need to have some kind of traffic rule of globalization. If globalization is some kind of a highway, 100-lane highway or whatever, that huge highway, where everybody is supposed to be moving from one part of the world to another part of the world, do the business. But today, all those lanes are taken over by the big businesses or big companies and the big countries. Once we have the traffic rules, then we know the slow-moving traffics and the weaker vehicles and the big trucks. So big trucks will be limited to certain lanes. Not every lane can be taken over by the big trucks. And then once we have the traffic rules, we'll need the traffic police and the traffic authority. So globalization doesn't have any one of these right now. As a result, it is the powerful takes it over. All the powerful companies and the countries take over the globalization process. And if it is free for all, it's free for only for the rich or big. And that is not the right globalization at all, if you leave it alone. So we need to have some kind of system in, introduced into it in a global system where everybody has a right, everybody benefits from globalization. And that's what is missing right now. I see, I see there are people leaving. <laughs> um, I'm making a, an executive decision. <laughs> uh, we'll take a few more questions. And then um, there is another performance, which is short, and then a presentation by the Bangladeshi Student Association. So um, I would like you to stay for the, for the remainder of the uh, 15 or 20 minutes that we have. And uh, I think this is a rare opportunity to ask questions of a Nobel Prize laureate. So next question. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm a high school student, and my name is Oni. Um, I'm really honored to be here tonight um, and listen to your lecture. And it made me think about a lot of stuff. So I have a question to make you think about something. Um, the education in America today affects Bengali students positively and negatively. And how do you feel about the differences of cultures between Bengali students in America compared to Bengali students in Bangladesh? Well, uh, education system-wise, uh, of course, uh, I have my own grievances to all education system, whether it's in Bangladesh or in the USA. Uh, but uh, it's one of the system which is very difficult to go through changes. And we need to, you see, the world is changing very fast, but we are not bringing that speed into our system so that the students can adjust themselves to the new world, new, system, new way of uh, preparing themselves for the coming years, which where their speed has to be consistent with the speed that is coming up, imposed on them. So this is what the education system mostly is missing. And also another thing that the education system tends to be very abstract. 
is not life-oriented. Uh, it's, it's a phenomenon everywhere. Ours is worse, but uh, it also applies to uh, uh, USA, that uh, students are more introduced to the abstract ideas in the books. They don't have the real understanding of the world, real understanding of people. They just know what their imagination is. Through their imagination, they try to figure this out. But the education system has to be oriented to real issues, real problems, and that has to be brought out. And one of the suggestions that I made that we should prepare our own wish list, what kind of world that we want to build. Once we have that wish list, hang it up in the wall and work for it. As a student, I prepare myself to create that world. Today, we don't have that wish list. We just study because it's there and you have to learn about it. And we don't know why I'm learning about it. Where do, does this fit in so that I can fulfill my dream, creating a world of my dream? And that relationship has to be established. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I apologize to everybody on the lines. I will take, unfortunately, two more questions, one from this side and one from that side. Thank you. This is Lab Luansar, editor, American news agency, Anna. I have two questions about Bangladesh present situation. There are reports that Bangladesh is going to be formed a national government comprising various political parties. The authority shows you the chief of that national government. Would you please tell us that you accept it or not? And I have another second question is that, do you have any comments on ongoing anti-corruption drive in Bangladesh? I didn't get the last one. Second do you one. have any comments on ongoing anti- I got it. I got it. The first one is a kind of a hypothetical question. I don't need to answer that. It's, it may be even a trick question. You never know what you have. <laughs> <laughs> On the anti-corruption um, drive, this is the first time Bangladesh got a chance to address the issue of corruption very solidly. And we, as a nation, we must be supporting it wholeheartedly so that all corrupt politicians get punished. If we miss this chance, this chance may not come back. So as soon as we, as when we have it, make the full use of it. Bangladesh never had a chance like this before in their lifetime. In cleansing our system, all the things that went wrong in our system, fix them up. And we are a lucky nation in that way. With all the shortcomings, all the difficulties of the credit gov caretaker government, we should wholeheartedly stand behind them so that all these achievements can be solidified and make it stable, make it permanent, so that nobody can dare to touch it anymore. Last question. Hi. Um um, I, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. My name is Farooq. I'm also a high school student. And I was listening to you very carefully today, and um, everything you said is really effective, and, and it is the fact, most of what you said. But uh, what you really didn't mention, what concerns me, not only me, every single one of us here as individuals, is that um, uh, this is an opinion question. I would like to know your opinion on it. Like, uh, what do you think about global warming? Like, um, what, what do you think about the future of our children? Because it concerns me as well as a kid. Yeah. And uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I was saying that we are in a very difficult position right now with the greenhouse gas emission and all the, and the particularly the role played by the United States in accepting the global opinion to restrain the global emission. So we hope the, global, uh, the, uh, the next administration in the USA will go wholeheartedly in supporting uh, all the efforts in bringing down the CO2 gas emission. 
and bring the safety, ensure the safety of the world. And as I was mentioning that uh, uh, today the global warming, uh, when we discuss it, is for some maybe it's an abstract discussion, but for us in Bangladesh, it's a life and death issue. It concerns our life not in future, right now. Things are happening in Bangladesh because of global warming, which is uh, making our life extremely difficult. Uh, our livelihood is becoming difficult. Our floods are becoming more frequent. Floods are becoming more intensive than before. And uh, cyclones like the one we recently had in November, the cedar, uh, is becoming more intensive. We are for, one of our early uh, cyclone was in 1970, which uh, killed about nearly half a million, over 400,000 people were killed in one cyclone. And then we had another one in 1991. Uh, there we had 148,000 people killed. So this one, Cedar, killed 5,000 people, but affected the entire region. The reason the death toll was not very high is not because the Cedar was not uh, strong enough. It was the strongest that we have so far, but because of the extra caution that uh, was taken in terms of building cyclone shelters and you know, safety places. That has helped save a lot of people. But it, if, if it keeps com coming back again and again, the entire region will be devastated permanently and our livelihoods and the population in that area will be all destroyed. So this is real everyday occurrence, it's not something. And as global warming increases, uh, uh, this will be more and more serious for us. So we have to take action right away. It's, a, it's not something that we can push back. And that is related to immediate action from the government side and also from the population side, individual side, to ask the question, how do I design my life? Uh, how do I design my enjoyment in life so that my enjoyment doesn't take away somebody else's life somewhere so that uh, I don't feel guilty? that I did something which harmed somebody else. And it can be done, it's a question of just paying attention to it. Once we all start paying attention to it, the whole issue of uh, global warming can be addressed very firmly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, that's the end of the questions. Um, I have to keep my promise to Mohammed Jangir. And I promised him that there would be two cultural events, two cultural performances. You heard the singers, and I think you were affected as everybody was by those singers. And now we have the other side, we have some dancers, and they will have a short performance, and then we will conclude the evening with a special presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. সামনে অথই অথই জলের নদী সামনে বৈকালি মেঘ কালো বরণ সামনে আধার নামে ঢেবের তালে আর বিপদ বেশে নদীর জলে সামনে অথই অথই জলের নদী সামনে বৈকালি মেঘ কালো বরণ 
सामने आधार नामे ढेवेर ताले हर भी पद में शे नो दिर जाले Bangladeshi Student Association at your college is a very active group. And when they found out that Professor Yunus was coming, they um, came to me and wanted to put together a journal. And that journal would talk about what their experiences were at York, comparison between studying in Bangladesh and studying here, and what it was like to receive the news on October 12th that Professor Yunus had won the Nobel Prize. I think each of you have received a copy of that journal. But what we'd like to do is have the students come up and present that journal to Dr. Yunus. Thank you, Jerry Postman. Assalamu alaikum and good evening again. At first, I'd like to pay my respect to the administrators and the staff of your college who have organized tonight's special event of greeting Dr. Muhammad Yunus. 
the Nobel Peace Prize winner of 2006. On the behalf of Bengali Student Association, I also say my thanks to you all who are, here, who are present here this evening. In today's program, on your way out, you will receive a special magazine produced by the members of Bengali Student Association of your college. This magazine has published with the help of Vice President Jerry Proseman, who worked so hard to put this magazine together, and his staff. Now, we are glad to present a magazine to the honorable guest, Dr. Muhammad Yunus. Okay. Dr. Yunus. One last, one last presentation. Okay. And that I owe a tremendous amount to a gentleman named Rush Delbari. And I mentioned earlier that he came to me a year and a half ago about putting on an event in this theater. Mr. Bari happens to be one of the most tenacious, focused individuals that I know. <laughs> whether he is here or he's in Bangladesh or wherever he is. In the break that took place in December and January, Mr. Bari returned to Bangladesh. And on his vacation, on his break, he published a book called The Saint, Mohammed Yunus, <laughs> with an introduction by that well-known Bangladeshi commentator, Jerry Posman. <laughs> and he did, a, he did a film as well. So that was what his winter vacation was like. Now we'll have to see what he does in the summertime. So Mr. Bari would like to present a copy of his book that he's worked on for a period of time. Wow. Uh, Madam President, uh, can you please come to the stage, please? Uh, Vice President Postman, thank you very much. I would like to tell you how I met Mohammed Yunus. People ask me a thousand times, how did you met the greatest man of the world. Let me tell you how did I met him. Uh, 2003, I was in the economic class. You know, I'm not, um, I'm not a good student. Um, I never been a, a attentive student. I never pay attention in my study. So what I did, I was trying to write a poems instead of listening to the professor. One of a sudden, a name uttered out from professor mouth, who is grabbed my attention. And I stood up and I asked professor, did you just mention Muhammad Yunus' name? He smiled like he caught me. He said, you're the most unattentive student I had. <laughs> End of the semester, it even more surprised me when I uh, found that uh, two of the questions came from Professor Yunus' concept, microcredit and his Grameen Bank, who has convinced me and motivate me to write a book about him. So I decided to go to Bangladesh and take his permission. I, then I went to Bangladesh and stepped into Grameen Bank. That, from that moment, Rashidul Bari's life has changed. That's why I call him saint, because he's changed my life. So now I would like to present my saint, my guru, the book, with Professor Yunus and the college president, Marcia Keys.
I would, I would like to say one more thing. The person who behind Muhammad Yunus' scholarship, I would uh, ask leave anybody but uh, Dr. Shaukut Ali, Abu Tahir, uh, uh, Professor Posman, and uh, uh, our Honorable Madam uh, President Marcia Keys. Uh, 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 I would uh, ask Abu Tahir uh, to present our Honorable Sir his uh, magazine. Uh, welcome Abu Tahir. Please welcome Abu Tahir. Presentations will uh, go on forever. Uh, uh, on January 21st, uh, York did its first benefit concert in this theater. Uh, a group called Three Mo Tenors came here, and it was the first time in York's history we had done something like that, and we said that was the first annual York College benefit concert, to repeat it every year. You get the message, <laughs> Professor Yunus? <laughs> and so what we'd like to do is invite Professor Yunus back whenever he can return to what we believe could be his home away from home. Thank you. There is a reception. Everybody that's here is welcome to reception next door in the small theater. So thank you very much and good night.